Law 26. Keep your hands clean. Judgment. You must seem a paragon of civility and efficiency. Your hands are never soiled by mistakes and nasty deeds. Maintain such a spotless appearance by using others as unwitting pawns and screens to disguise your involvement. Part 1. Conceal your mistakes. Have a scapegoat around to take the blame. Our good name and reputation depend more on what we conceal than on what we reveal. Everyone makes mistakes, but those who are truly clever manage to hide them and to make sure someone else is blamed. A convenient scapegoat should always be kept around for such moments. Observance of the Law Near the end of the 2nd century A.D., as China's mighty Han Empire slowly collapsed, the great general and imperial minister Tao Tao emerged as the most powerful man in the country. Seeking to extend his power base and to rid himself of the last of his rivals, Tao Tao began a campaign to take control of the strategically vital central plain. During the siege of a key city, he slightly miscalculated the timing for supplies of grain to arrive from the capital. As he waited for the shipment to come in, the army ran low on food, and Tao Tao was forced to order the chief of commissariat to reduce its rations. Tao Tao kept a tight rein on the army and ran a network of informers. His spies soon reported that the men were complaining, grumbling that he was living well while they themselves had barely enough to eat. Perhaps Tao Tao was keeping the food for himself, they murmured. If the grumbling spread, Tao Tao could have a mutiny on his hands. He summoned the chief of commissariat to his tent. I want to ask you to lend me something, and you must not refuse, Tao Tao told the chief. What is it? the chief replied. I want the loan of your head to show to the troops, said Tao Tao. But I've done nothing wrong, cried the chief. I know, said Tao Tao with a sigh, but if I do not put you to death, there will be a mutiny. Do not grieve. After you're gone, I'll look after your family. Put this way, the request left the chief no choice. So he resigned himself to his fate and was beheaded that very day. Seeing his head on public display, the soldiers stopped grumbling. Some saw through Tao Tao's gesture, but kept quiet, stunned, and intimidated by his violence, and most accepted his version of who was to blame, preferring to believe in his wisdom and fairness than in his incompetence and cruelty. Interpretation Occasional mistakes are inevitable. The world is just too unpredictable. People of power, however, are undone not by the mistakes they make, but by the way they deal with them. Like surgeons, they must cut away the tumor with speed and finality. Excuses satisfy no one, and apologies make everyone uncomfortable. The mistake does not vanish with an apology. It deepens and festers. Better to cut it off instantly, distract attention from yourself, and focus attention on a convenient scapegoat before people have time to ponder your responsibility or your possible incompetence. Keys to Power the use of scapegoats is as old as civilization itself, and examples of it can be found in cultures around the world. The main idea behind these sacrifices is the shifting of guilt and sin to an outside figure, object, animal, or man, which is then banished or destroyed. The bloody sacrifice of the scapegoat seems a barbaric relic of the past, but the practice lives on to this day, if indirectly and symbolically. Since power depends on appearances, and those in power must seem never to make mistakes, the use of scapegoats is as popular as ever. What modern leader will take responsibility for his blunders? He searches out others to blame, a scapegoat to sacrifice. When Mao Zedong's cultural revolution failed miserably, he made no apologies or excuses to the Chinese people. Instead, like Tao Tao before him, he offered up scapegoats, including his own personal secretary and high-ranking member of the party, Chen Bo Da. 
Franklin D. Roosevelt had a reputation for honesty and fairness. Throughout his career, however, he faced many situations in which being the nice guy would have spelled political disaster, yet he could not be seen as the agent of any foul play. For twenty years, then, his secretary, Lewis Howe, handled the backroom deals, the manipulation of the press, the underhanded campaign maneuvers. And whenever a mistake was committed, or a dirty trick contradicting Roosevelt's carefully crafted image became public, Howe served as a scapegoat and never complained. Finally, history has time and again shown the value of using a close associate as a scapegoat. This is known as the fall of the favorite. Most kings had a personal favorite at court, a man whom they singled out sometimes for no apparent reason and lavished with favors and attention. But this court favorite could serve as a convenient scapegoat in case of a threat to the king's reputation. The public would readily believe in the scapegoat's guilt. Why would the king sacrifice his favorite unless he were guilty? And the other courtiers, resentful of the favorite anyway, would rejoice at his downfall. The king, meanwhile, would rid himself of a man who by that time had probably learned too much about him, perhaps becoming arrogant and even disdainful of him. Choosing a close associate as a scapegoat has the same value as the fall of the favorite. You may lose a friend or aid, but in the long-term scheme of things, it is more important to hide your mistakes than to hold on to someone who one day will probably turn against you. Besides, you can always find a new favorite to take his place. Part 2. Make Use of the Cat's Paw In the fable, the monkey grabs the paw of his friend, the cat, and uses it to fish chestnuts out of the fire, thus getting the nuts he craves without hurting himself. If there is something unpleasant or unpopular that needs to be done, it is far too risky for you to do the work yourself. You need a cat's paw, someone who does the dirty, dangerous work for you. The cat's paw grabs what you need, hurts whom you need hurt, and keeps people from noticing that you are the one responsible. Let someone else be the executioner or the bearer of bad news while you bring only joy and glad tidings. Observance of the Law In 59 B.C., the future Queen Cleopatra of Egypt, then ten years old, witnessed the overthrow and banishment of her father, Ptolemy XII, at the hand of his eldest daughters, her own sisters. One of the daughters, Berenice, emerged as the leader of the rebellion, and to ensure that she would now rule Egypt alone, she imprisoned her other sisters and murdered her own husband. This may have been necessary as a practical step to secure her rule, but that a member of the royal family, a queen no less, would so overtly exact such violence on her own family, horrified her subjects, and stirred up powerful opposition. Four years later, this opposition was able to return Ptolemy to power, and he promptly had Berenice and the other elder sisters beheaded. In 51 B.C., Ptolemy died, leaving four remaining children as heirs. As was the tradition in Egypt, the eldest son, Ptolemy XIII, only ten at the time, married the elder sister, Cleopatra, now eighteen, and the couple took the throne together as king and queen. None of the four children felt satisfied with this. Everyone, including Cleopatra, wanted more power. A struggle emerged between Cleopatra and Ptolemy, each trying to push the other to the side. In 48 B.C., with the help of a government faction that feared Cleopatra's ambitions, Ptolemy was able to force his sister to flee the country, leaving himself as sole ruler. In exile, Cleopatra schemed. She wanted to rule alone and to restore Egypt to its past glory, 
a goal she felt none of her other siblings could achieve, yet as long as they were alive, she could not realize her dream. And the example of Berenice had made it clear that no one would serve a queen who was seen murdering her own kind. Even Ptolemy XIII had not dared murder Cleopatra, although he knew she would plot against him from abroad. Within a year after Cleopatra's banishment, the Roman dictator Julius Caesar arrived in Egypt, determined to make the country a Roman colony. Cleopatra saw her chance. Re-entering Egypt in disguise, she traveled hundreds of miles to reach Caesar in Alexandria. Legend has it that she had herself smuggled into his presence, rolled up inside a carpet, which was gracefully unfurled at his feet, revealing the young queen. Cleopatra immediately went to work on the Roman. She appealed to his love of spectacle and his interest in Egyptian history and poured on her feminine charms. Caesar soon succumbed and restored Cleopatra to the throne. Cleopatra's siblings seethed. She had outmaneuvered them. Ptolemy XIII would not wait to see what happened next. From his palace in Alexandria, he summoned a great army to march on the city and attack Caesar. In response, Caesar immediately put Ptolemy and the rest of the family under house arrest. But Cleopatra's younger sister, Arsinoe, escaped from the palace and placed herself at the head of the approaching Egyptian troops, proclaiming herself Queen of Egypt. Now Cleopatra finally saw her chance. She convinced Caesar to release Ptolemy from house arrest, under the agreement that he would broker a truce. Of course, she knew he would do the opposite, that he would fight Arsinoe for control of the Egyptian army. But this was to Cleopatra's benefit, for it would divide the royal family. Better still, it would give Caesar the chance to defeat and kill her siblings in battle. Reinforced by troops from Rome, Caesar swiftly defeated the rebels. In the Egyptians' retreat, Ptolemy drowned in the Nile. Caesar captured Arsinoe and had her sent to Rome as a prisoner. He also executed the numerous enemies who had conspired against Cleopatra and imprisoned others who had opposed her. To reinforce her position as uncontested queen, Cleopatra now married the only sibling left, Ptolemy the Fourteenth only eleven at the time, and the weakest of the lot. Four years later, Ptolemy mysteriously died of poison. In 41 BC, Cleopatra employed on a second Roman leader, Mark Antony, the same tactic she had used so well on Julius Caesar. After seducing him, she hinted to him that her sister Arsinoe, still a prisoner in Rome, had conspired to destroy him. Mark Antony believed her and promptly had Arsinoe executed, thereby getting rid of the last of the siblings who had posed such a threat to Cleopatra. Interpretation Legend has it that Cleopatra succeeded through her seductive charms, but in reality her power came from an ability to get people to do her bidding without realizing they were being manipulated. Caesar and Antony not only rid her of her most dangerous siblings, Ptolemy the Thirteenth and Arsinoe, they decimated all of her enemies in both the government and the military. The two men became her cat's paws. They entered the fire for her, did the ugly but necessary work while shielding her from appearing as the destroyer of her siblings and fellow Egyptians. And in the end, both men acquiesced to her desire to rule Egypt not as a Roman colony, but as an independent allied kingdom. And they did all this for her without realizing how she had manipulated them. This was persuasion of the subtlest and most powerful kind. A queen must never dirty her hands with ugly tasks, nor can a king appear in public with blood on his face. Yet power cannot survive without the constant squashing of enemies. There will always be dirty little tasks that have to be done to keep you on the throne. Like Cleopatra, you need a cat's paw. This will usually be a person from outside your immediate circle, who will therefore be unlikely to realize how he or she is being used. You will find these dupes everywhere, 
people who enjoy doing you favors, especially if you throw them a minimal bone or two in exchange. But as they accomplish tasks that may seem to them innocent enough, or at least completely justified, they are actually clearing the field for you, spreading the information you feed them, undermining people they do not realize are your rivals, inadvertently furthering your cause, dirtying their hands while yours remain spotless. Keys to Power As a leader, you may imagine that constant diligence and the appearance of working harder than anyone else signify power. Actually, though, they have the opposite effect. They imply weakness. Why are you working so hard? Perhaps you are incompetent and have to put in extra effort just to keep up. Perhaps you are one of those people who does not know how to delegate and has to meddle in everything. The truly powerful, on the other hand, seem never to be in a hurry or overburdened. While others work their fingers to the bone, they take their leisure. They know how to find the right people to put in the effort while they save their energy and keep their hands out of the fire. Similarly, you may believe that by taking on the dirty work yourself, involving yourself directly in unpleasant actions, you impose your power and instill fear. In fact, you make yourself look ugly and abusive of your high position. Truly powerful people keep their hands clean. Only good things surround them, and the only announcements they make are of glorious achievements. You will often find it necessary, of course, to expend energy or to effect an evil but necessary action. But you must never appear to be this action's agent. Find a cat's paw. Develop the arts of finding, using, and, in time, getting rid of these people when their cat's paw role has been fulfilled. The easiest and most effective way to use a cat's paw is often to plant information with him that he will then spread to your primary target. False or planted information is a powerful tool, especially if spread by a dupe whom no one suspects. You will find it very easy to play innocent and disguise yourself as the source. <laughs>